services of First Baptist Church, Lake Worth, Texas. I'm Charles McLaughlin. I'm the pastor here. We're glad to have you uh, with us today. Uh, we're going to be looking at how to overcome, which is a, kind of appropriate for the times in which we uh, uh, find ourselves with the pandemic. Uh, we do have a, a rise uh, going on in cases uh, here in Texas. Uh, San Antonio uh, is the third largest uh, increasing uh, uh, city in the uh, United States, uh, just for example. And uh, then we have stuff going on in Florida and California and other areas. Some states are doing better and some states are uh, having a uh, resurgence. So uh, we do want to encourage everyone to wear your mask and follow the protocol that uh, uh, your, ent your governing entities have uh, for you and just uh, be as careful as we can. Uh, to try to uh, to keep it uh, as limited uh, as, as possible. And don't forget to be praying for one another and continue to ask uh, our Lord for mercy, not only for ourselves, but for everybody around the world and those who uh, have been most affected uh, by this. And there's two ways of being affected. One is uh, the physical problems that you have and even just the isolation that takes place when you're in quarantine. Uh, the other is the economic uh, impact that's on us. Uh, with over 40 million people going on unemployment in the United States, you've, you've got a lot of serious issues uh, with the economy and it's still having ripple effects and things like that. So we need to be praying uh, for our country as well as for our world uh, in terms of the needs that, that exist all around us. Uh, one of the other problems we have is that when we're giving, there's just so many places that, that need uh, financial uh, assistance and yet it, it's hard to, to come about doing that unless you have your normal economy going on. Uh, one other thing, we'll, we'll talk a little bit at the end about some things in our church. Uh, we have a vote going on that I want to tell you about and talk to you about a little bit. We have a gas line that's still having problems and uh, we got some plumbing issues. So we, we've got stuff like that. We'll talk to you about that. But right now we want to focus on our worship of God. I'll be talking about overcoming like I said. And uh, that's something we all need and need to look at. We'll be looking at uh, a woman whose name is Deborah out of the book of Judges, chapters 4 and 5. Let's have a word of prayer together as we get started. Father, we thank you for your love for us, your wonderful, awesome, and mighty God. We thank you for loving us and caring for us, giving us your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we have uh, through him. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit for the gift of the Bible, whose word that we read and depend upon and then seek to apply into our living. And Father, we thank you also for the church and other churches, community of believers, who we can uh, share the cause of Christ with. Father, be with us today as we seek to worship you, speak to our hearts, and help us to be open and honest with you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
COVID activities that we're having to experience. Uh, Ann and I had a little scare. We thought one of the friends, uh, one friend of ours that uh, uh, we've been just in minor contact with had, had it. She did not have it. And, uh, but you don't, you don't know. So then you, you start hiding out and, and, and you know, secluding yourself and, and worrying and waiting and wondering what's, what's going on. And it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. Even when you don't have it, you still have to go through uh, certain protocols and it, it becomes uh, something that all of us are mindful of and something that uh, it's like an obstacle that we have to overcome. So with that, we really find ourselves in circumstances that we cannot control. Uh, we cannot choose our circumstances. However, we can choose who we are going to be in those circumstances. You know, I, I like history because it gives us uh, some idea of those who have preceded us and give us examples of how to overcome or at least uh, kind of witness and see what they did or at least know that somebody uh, had really difficult circumstances and were able to make it through. Uh, Johnny Fulton was run over by a car at the age of three. He suffered crushed hips, broken ribs, a fractured skull, and compound fractures in his legs. It did not look as if he would ever live, but instead he did not give up and he did live. In fact, he later, get this, ran the half mile in less than two minutes after going through that. Uh, Walt Davis was totally paralyzed by polio when he was nine years old, but he did not give up. He became an Olympic high jump champion in 1952. Woodrow Wilson could not read until he was, how old do you think? Seven, eight, try 10 years old. That's when he could start to read. But he was a committed person. Of course, he became the 28th president of the United States. Now, my last one, I'm going to give you some information and see if you can guess who it is, all right, as you're hearing me tell about uh, him. At the age of seven, he had to go to work to support his family. At nine, his mother died. At 22, he lost his job as a store clerk. At 23, he ran into debt, went into debt and became a partner in a small store. At 26, his partner died, leaving him a huge debt. By the age of 35, he had been defeated twice when running for a seat in Congress. At the age of 37, he won the election. At 39, he lost his re-election bid. At 41, his four-year-old son died. At 42, he was rejected for a land officer role. At 45, he ran for the Senate and lost. At 47, he was defeated for the nomination of vice president. At 49, he ran for Senate again and lost again. At the age of 51, he was elected president of the United States. During his second term of office, he was assassinated, but his name lives on among the greats in US history. Have you guessed it? Abraham Lincoln. You see, we all have times of knowing people, at least in history and probably in our lives, and I know certainly in our church, where people have been overcomers or are presently being overcomers. We want to look at the story of a woman named Deborah. It's found in the book of Judges, and it's a great little story. And uh, it tells about how they had been in oppression uh, for 20, over 20 years, and I want to read just a, a little portion of it to you. Chapter 4, verse 1. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, uh, now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, and they treated them horribly, uh, the, the Canaanites did, and they had Sisera, is, uh, Sisera is the name of the general of the Canaanites, and he had 900 iron chariots. And when he went to attack, he was ruthless in how he used his chariots. And of course, they were able to move quickly and get to where they needed to be. And they were just, everybody was afraid <coughs> and terrified of these uh, uh, chariots. Now, meanwhile, Israel was led by a man named Barak, B-A-R-A-K. And he had, there was a prophetess in the land and her name was Deborah. And 
Uh, Barak is the general, but Deborah is the one who everybody came to to see about making decisions. And she was kind of like a, a judge. You bring me your problems and I decide what's going on there. But she was also a prophetess, which means she also heard from God and God would uh, speak to her and she would share those messages uh, with the people as well. So in this, they, they decide, Deborah gets a message from God and decides they need to go to war. And so she tells Barak, uh, listen, here, here's what I want you to do. You're going to take everybody down toward the river, and we're going to, uh, I'll draw Sisera and all the, the chariots out to me, and then you'll attack with 10,000 men, and God has said we will win, and you'll defeat them. Well, Barak was, uh, he was afraid of this, and so one of the things he says, if you will go with me, I will go. Very well <coughs> said, Deborah, I will go with you. But, she says, because of the way you're going about this, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. Now, with this, I don't know about you, when I read it right there, I'm going, ah, so Deborah's going to be the one who's going to kill Sisera, the great general uh, of the enemy. But that's not what happens. Let me tell you a little bit more about the story. They go to war. When they go to war, Josephus, the historian, says this. He tells us a, that a cold storm of sleet, rain, and hail came on the day of battle. It was driving into the face of Sisera and his soldiers. His archers were disabled. Swordsmen were crippled by the cold. And the chariots, they simply sank in the mud. The Bible says they left their chariots. And Sisera, Sisera actually ran. Uh, on foot to get out of there because of the battle and how he was being defeated. He flees to what he thinks is a friend's tent. And I'm going to read to you what happens to him after he flees. Now his army has been defeated and Barak and Deborah and their soldiers are out after him. And he's running from them for his life. And so what happens is we go to verse 18 to get the rest of the story. Barak pursued the chariots and army as, as for quite a distance. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of, a, of Jael. Jael is the wife of Heber the Kenite. So it's Jael is the wife's name and Heber is the husband's name. Uh, because he ran to them because there was an alliance between uh, their king and his. So, it's, uh, so Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here, say no. So she acts like she is covering for him, and she's put him in safety, so he thinks, and he falls asleep. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quickly to him while he lay fast asleep exhausted she drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died i always i always smile when i read that and she, she does all this and he died and i'm going well what do you think would happen to him <laughs> <laughs> just then Barak came by in pursuit of sisera jl went out to meet him come she said i will show you the man you're looking for so he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, and of course he was dead. And so with that, you have the, the prophecy made by Deborah coming true in the fact that uh, it's Jael, the woman, who gets credit for killing the great general and not Barak. So with this, you, you have this, uh, this event that happens, and Deborah is the one who really makes everything happen. Without her... Barak's not going to go. Without her, they're not going to, to conquer the Canaanites. And afterwards, she becomes kind of the leader, the, the, the judge, if you will, uh, for that particular time. And so for many years after that, they have peace as she uh, rules uh, the nation uh, with Barak as the general. Now with this, we have three roles of Deborah that you need to understand. One is she's a homemaker. She was married, and uh, she lived in the hill country, so she's... Uh, she's the, you know, she's a mother and has all this kind of stuff going on with the with the family life. Secondly, she was a prophet. She was a deep, deeply spiritual woman. 
uh, discerning what God wants to do, but also how to be fair and just in difficult circumstances, as thus other people came to her uh, for, for her to make a judgment. But she was also a motivator. She motivated men for battle, to get them to go and to fight and to do what was right and to watch the timing of it to make sure it was all going to work. You see, really, they were afraid to go out. And she had promised them, if we do it at a certain time, God has promised. And sure enough, God brings the storm and the rain. And, and when, when Sisera brings out all those chariots, for some reason, he's not expecting that bad weather. That's why he takes all his chariots and he goes after them, only to be caught in this storm that helps them to be defeated. So how did Deborah actually overcome? How was she as an overcomer? First of all, remember, they're under persecution. They are threatened by a very large and powerful army from the Canaanites, and yet she's able to help her nation, her people, overcome. Number one, obstacles have to be overcome. Remember, you can't choose your circumstances, so we're all going to have different kinds of circumstances and different kinds of obstacles. One of her obstacles that we might not even think about today, but her gender, her being a woman, was an obstacle because you don't find that many women who are prophetess. You don't find many that are leading in battle that do what she did. So the first thing you've got to look at is women in Jewish and Greek culture at that time. Ancient Middle East culture had an extremely low view of women. Women were seen as property, either of their father or husband. They could not testify in court. They could not inherit property. They could not claim any right to have an education. In fact, it was said by some, it is better to burn the Torah than to teach it to a woman. I mean, it, you see, you kind of get a grip of where they're at. Greek men had three reasons for gratitude, and this is what they said. The Greek men would say, we th we're thankful that we were not made a beast, a barbarian, or a woman. That's what they said. Well, surely the, the, the Jews are much better then uh, because, you know, they have the scripture and they have a relationship with God. Surely they're better. No, the Jews thanked God daily that they were not made a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. That's how they viewed it. So Deborah really did accomplish a lot because realize she's in a day and time where women are not well respected and not well thought of and have very limited rights. And with that, we, we realized that she really was an overcomer because she overcame her gender just to be a judge and to, to even have Iraq saying, I'm not going unless you, the woman, go with me, all right? So with that, you have one thing that she is an obstacle, and she has to, to do it. She becomes the only woman in the Bible placed at the top of political power by common consent of the people. Second obstacle is she had to get over the obstacle of others who lacked vision and courage. Notice Barak. He's not alone. A lot of his men, they've been sitting there. They had 10,000 men, and they never attacked Instead, they kind of defended themselves, but there was never a, a superior kind of strategy for battle until Deborah gets into it. There's a lack of vision and the understanding of what is out there and what to do, as well as a lack of courage to go out there and do it. And she had to overcome their lack of vision and courage. Number three, she also had her own fear. Certainly, she was like anybody would have fear going against that massive kind of force and having chariots and you not having chariots. They're having archers. They're having, I mean, they're full up and made for battle and your people uh, just aren't as experienced or as well uh, fortified in terms of being able to, to do that. So she had her own fear of I've got to go down there with them and she had to overcome that. And there's always a fear when you're going to go into battle like that. Now, those were her obstacles. We all have different obstacles that we have to overcome in our lives. For example, if you're a, a young, uh, young family, you've got parenting, and you've got parenting of the kids. Now, if you have a, a baby and you've got uh, kids, Jenna, I'm kind of thinking of you know, Jenna's age group where they've got you know, three kids, you know, they're all different ages there and stuff like that. Some people have them where they're you know, even 10 years apart, you have different kinds of obstacles. And it's not that the kids are doing anything wrong. 
It's just kids being kids <laughs> become obstacles for how you're going to manage your life. And should I say keep your sanity, so to speak? <laughs> you know, you, you've got, I mean, they're just going to do what they do. And, you know, without school and all the kind of stuff, the things that you've been having to deal with, and then you've got the COVID thing, there's just parenting. Now, you don't realize it's not over. The obstacles really take a lot more effect when they become teenagers. Ah, yes, right. They'll become teenagers, and you'll have even greater obstacles at that time. And it really doesn't stop. It gets better sometimes along the way, but it, there's give and take in parenting all the time. It's just a challenge. But we also have with us right now economic trials and tribulations. Right now we've got people who are, I, I feel so sorry for the sports people. Oh my gosh. Do you know some of them have lost $23 million this year? That's because they make like $75 million. <laughs> You know, and, and so they're, they're losing money. You have other people that are losing money. Uh, you have a lot of things that are happening because jobs are not getting done or being done, and everybody is just a, a low kind of thing. If you have it, you're, you're fortunate. Uh, you have uh, a lot of situations there with the economy, and there's, you become very afraid. But you know what? There are other obstacles. Sometimes when you make a lot of money, that too can become an obstacle. It becomes an obstacle because you start depending on yourself instead of, instead of having dependence upon God for what you, you do and, and for being grateful for what God has given to you and handling that in an ethical manner. So even having money can be an obstacle. Then you've got aging and health. And many of you who are listening and get this, uh, you know, even just being able to play this on your phone can be an obstacle. <laughs> All right, and you have to have somebody else, and you can hand it off to a six-year-old, and he'll figure out how to tell you to do it real quick. It doesn't take him but a minute. I don't know how they get that, but they do. So you have aging and health, but you know it's not just those who are aging or having health issues. Realize that there are other people in the family who are having to deal with us in the midst of our uh, situations. Uh, my daughter has a good friend in Brownwood, uh, Texas. And uh, she spent this last uh, uh, week, uh, last 10 days, she had uh, two days where she was spending time with her mother who was dying. And she spent the last two days of, of the mother's life being with her, only to turn around three days later and uh, having her husband's father pass away. So the only parents that they had, and both of them were widows, both of the parents that they had both died within three days of each other, uh, one in Amarillo and one in Denver. And so you had all the distance and all that kind of stuff. So realize as you look at your obstacles, other people have obstacles. And sometimes our obstacles seem small in comparison to what some other people are going through. The second thing we realized is not only did she have obstacles to overcome, but she had to really look for the opportunity to overcome. Notice this, in the, in the story, what you have is she listens to God and realizes there is a certain timing for them to be able to defeat uh, the Canaanites. Now for that to happen, the army has to get up and be ready to go in a short period of time and to get everybody ready so that God is going to orchestrate how the weather is going to be, all right? And so it has to be at that time. The next day, it may not be that way. The next day, it may not be that way. It's gonna be right then. There's an opportunity, and she recognizes it, thus she motivates others to come and let's, uh, let's be, be victorious and gain our freedom. Number one is you have to look for the opportunity in your own life for what is facing you right now. The problem we have in looking for the opportunity is having the patience to wait and to wait and to wait. <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes it, it gets to be very scary while you're waiting. You're waiting for the test results from a COVID test. Uh, you're waiting to see if you're gonna, if you're gonna work. You're waiting to see what's happening to your parents or to yourself on whatever health test you're having. There's a lot of waiting sometimes that you're just, and right now sometimes you're just waiting at home because you're afraid to get out. 
So we look for the opportunity, but we have to wait, have patience, but do not quit looking for the opportunity to defeat and overcome the obstacles that you are facing. Secondly, take action at the right time. If you're looking for the, op the opportunity, when you see it, you have got to act and act on it then. Don't wait, don't delay, all right? Uh, notice that she responds with action to stand against the oppressors while others are satisfied to sit and do nothing. She tells them we've got to get up and go and fight. Now is the time to do it. And they're going, we're not really sure. We're, we're afraid. We don't know if we're going to. She, she says, now is the time to take action and to do something. You know, sometimes opportunity, uh, it, it requires us to move right then and there. However, sometimes we are thinking, here's the obstacle, and we're, we're kind of waiting, and we're kind of, and as you wait, all of a sudden, your own anxiety can become an, ob an obstacle. And sometimes opportunity is not what we think. It's a little different. Carl Menninger is a world-famous psychiatrist and was answering questions after giving a lecture on mental health. One person asked, what would you advise someone to do if he felt a nervous breakdown coming on? <laughs> Most people expected the doctor to say, consult a psychiatrist. Instead, he said, you ready? Lock up your house. Go across the railroad tracks. Find someone in need and do something to help that person. See, sometimes a psychiatrist knows that those who serve others have less mental and psychological problems than those that just focus on themselves. The best way to bring on a heart attack or a mental emotional breakdown is to think about yourself all the time. When you're looking at your obstacle, look at the opportunities, but also listen to what is the right thing to do, the good thing to do, and also don't just think of yourself all the time. You need to look across the street and see how you can help, uh, help others to help you see differently. Number three, uh, not only did she have the opportunity to overcome, but she had to experience and give faith in God to wait, look, and act. One of the things I'm impressed with her about is her ability to, to overcome by having faith. And the truth is, uh, when you look at overcomers in the Word of God, all of them, the one consistent thing that they have is the ability to have faith in God. Their faith is what motivates them to go and to do something with their lives in a way that overcomes the obstacle. Even if it was like when I preached on David and Goliath and and the faith in God helped him to face Goliath as an obstacle. And it was his faith in God. You'll see that all throughout Scripture, all through the battles. All of them are having, you've got to have faith in God. Just today, uh, I, had, I was experiencing things in my own uh, construction company. And I talked to God and I said, I'm afraid and, and I have my fears. And, uh, and one of the things I said, I asked God, I said, Father, I need more faith. i got to have faith in you to face the obstacles that are there and they're unknown and they're circumstances that I cannot control, but I want to be a person who has faith in the midst of those circumstances. So I join you, I ask you to join Deborah and to be follow her example, to have faith in God. And part of what she has to do is wait. She's waiting till the right time. God shows her the right time because she's sensitively praying and listening trying to hear what God is saying, and when God speaks, that's when she acts. She has faith in God, even when other, when it's not real popular with everybody else. They've kind of given up on God, and she keeps saying, no, I'll be sensitive to the Spirit, of, uh, to God. When others quit listening, I'm going to keep listening, and I'm going to have my faith. I'm going to wait, look, and act. Number four, after faith, we see that she also had something that all of them have when they overcome, and that is courage. The courage to act even when you are afraid. Now, sometimes you have to have courage even when you can't act and you are afraid. It still takes courage, but courage comes 
out of our experience of faith in God. God many times tells uh, those who are about to go into battle, have courage. Why? I am with you. Have courage because I've not left you alone. We need to remember in the midst of what is happening right now, what obstacles you are facing right now, whether it's parenting, economic, health, age, separation from people that you love because you can't get to them because of the, the situations we're in right now, whatever it is, remember God is still with you. He has not abandoned us. He is with you. Have courage because I am with you. Then you can have faith also and go and, and have look for the opportunities to defeat those obstacles. She had great courage when others were controlled by their fear. I'm not going to go unless you go with me, <laughs> Barak said in his general outfit, talking to the woman, and the woman says, fine, I'll go with you, and I'll be the one who's the strong one in this deal, and you're not my husband, but, but we're, we're going to do this, but I'll lead the way, and that's what happens. She would face the chariots of iron. She would not sit at home. She got up, and she went. She would lead others to act, and she would motivate others to also have courage and to join her in this battle. You see, courage can be contagious. In fact, it is contagious. She would not keep her faith to herself. She motivated and influenced others to do the purposes of God. Number five, the last thing that she did, and a lot of people don't think about this, but this is a part of, of overcoming. She's already overcome. They're defeated. Now what she's going to do? Well, the whole chapter 5 is called The Song of Deborah. I'll not read it for you. You can read it on your own. It's rather long, actually. It's a long storytelling uh, ballad, if you will. And what she does is she expresses her gratitude when the obstacle is overcome. I think that's very important. Sometimes what we do is we overcome the obstacle, we go and celebrate, and we forget to stop and thank God for what God has done and how he has shown us mercy and given us a sustenance or even uh, whatever we, we need at that time to get through what we are experiencing in our lives. We need to have gratitude and thankfulness to God. Uh, when we join together to have prayer on Wednesday nights, that's one of the things uh, we look at is we, we see God answering a lot of prayers. There's a lot of prayers needed, but there's a lot of things happening in the life of our church and the people that we're praying for where we see how God has answered our prayers. Amen. Now with this, let me conclude by giving you just a few little lessons here. Overcomers work together to serve the purpose of God. She did not act alone. She got others, Barak, others and the, the, all the, the army went. Overcomers work together. Not isolated, they work together to serve a greater purpose than their own self. They serve the purposes of God. Secondly, overcoming is not just for men. It's for women and children and teenagers. It's for all of us. And when you see Deborah as the hero of the story, it is a champion cause for women to realize they too can lead in overcoming. There's times where men, we need to lean on them, and they need to lean on us at other times. We take turns on doing that. We give each other the support that we need, and it's not just the support of husband and wife. It can be support of friends in a community of faith where we are all encouraging one another to be who we ought to be in following Christ. Number three, overcomers often go down the road less traveled. And yes, I'm taking that from Scott Peck's book, The Road Less Traveled. A lot of times what you have is overcomers don't take the path where everybody else is going. Instead, they take a different path, the smaller path. And Jesus even recommends that path to take the path uh, that, that's, that's not often traveled by everybody and not popular many times. Overcomers need to look for and have the courage to not always seek to be uh, popular, not go to the wide gate, but to go through the narrow gate. Fifthly, overcomers are willing to, or fourth, overcomers are willing to sacrifice their comfort in order to do what God asked them to do. Almost every person 
even those that I mentioned at the very beginning of this sermon, all those overcomers had pain and problems, breaks, hurts, physical attributes and things that were happening, losses. All of them had things they had to overcome in order to be an overcomer. And overcomers are willing to sacrifice their comfort. Now, what that means is if comfort is more important to you than the purposes of God, don't expect to really be that much of an overcomer. It's just what it is. So with that, we need to understand our comfort is not what is really important to God's purposes. I know, I know, that's disappointing, but that's the truth. God didn't send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross so we could be comfortable. He had a purpose for us to reach others for Christ, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, and to learn how to love and practice love for one another. Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish theologian and philosopher, told a, a little parable that he called the wild duck of Denmark. All right? And the wild ducks were flying northward uh, with his mates across Europe during the springtime. In route, one duck happened to land in a barnyard in Denmark where he quickly made friends with the tame ducks that lived there. And the wild ducks went on and he decided to stay with the tame ones and he enjoyed the corn and the fresh water. He decided to stay for an hour, liked it, decided to stay for a day, then he decided to stay for a week, and finally he stayed there a month. And at the end of the season, he contemplated flying to, to join uh, his, his friends in the Northland, but it was so comfortable there, he decided to stay. Well, the seasons changed, and he heard on an autumn day the, uh, his friends, the wild ducks, flying going south. They'd been north, now they're coming south. And en route, uh, he, would, he felt the, the, the excitement of going out and flying and decided, I'll join them. So he starts flapping his wings, and he starts to fly, and he can't clear the rooftop. <laughs> he can't clear the fence. Because he got so big and heavy from sitting there being comfortable that he can't do anything. So he stays there for a while and he waddles back to the safety of the barnyard and he muddles to himself. Wow. And he muddles to himself, I think I'll just stay here seeing I can't fly over anything and just see how much longer I can, I can stay. And the, after a while what happens is he realizes he doesn't even think about them anymore. The wild duck who used to enjoy the freedom of the wild spaces, now stays in the little barn, barn yard, eating corn, drinking water, and basically getting fat. And that's what he does. And it's not, it's not about weight here. What it's talking about is he just, I, I wondered why Kierkegaard didn't end up just having him be one of the ducks for dinner. <laughs> you know, because I saw that as a real possibility. Uh, but with that, realize that's what, what happens to us. We cannot allow comfort, and that's what Kierkegaard is pointing to. Don't let comfort keep you from doing what God wants you to do and to pursue. The great things God has in store for us always requires us to have faith and courage. There are always obstacles, obstacles to overcome. And we always, though, have an opportunity that God says, now's the time, go. I hope that you'll face your obstacles with hope, with patience, but also with courage, with faith, and determination. And don't give up. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for loving us and caring for us. You're a great, awesome God. Father, give us the kind of character we need to be overcomers in the variety of different obstacles that face us now and for what is ahead. You love us. May we always know that you're with us. May we also find others who can help us through in defeating the obstacles that lay before us. In Jesus' name, amen.
this way. We, we hope that it's helpful to you because we realize not everybody can come. So, and we've learned uh, it, it really has forced our hand to, to pick up on the uh, uh, way of, of communicating to everybody, especially when you, you can't come to church uh, and, and be with us in the, the services. Uh, there's a couple of things I needed to talk to you about. Uh, first, let me take the, uh, uh, the, the leaks, uh, not the leak, but the, the gas leaks that we've been having. Uh, in order for us to have gas in the church, you cannot have leaks outside. So when we did, uh, Atmos came by and told us we had leaks, and so uh, we have a plumber who started that, and it's been, uh, we're, we're, he tested, we laid out one line, and then he tested, and we have another leak someplace else, we have another leak coming into the uh, auditorium. Now the gas is turned off, so there's no danger. He just turns it on, tests it, and turns it back off if there's a leak. And so he has to test what's uh, on the outside and then what's on the inside. But uh, uh, if you come by, you can see where we've dug out holes and things like that. The rain stopped us for a few days. But uh, if you have any extra giving that you can help us with this, it's gonna, it's, it's just something we, we, the pipes are old. That's what's happened. So that's, that's where we go. We've also had a few little plumbing problems with the bathrooms inside too. We're taking care of that. The uh, second thing that, uh, that we're doing is this Sunday, uh, when you're getting this, we'll be voting on, on uh, Sunday to decide if we're going to have Calvary Bible Church plant, uh, use our facility for planting uh, a church. It will be the first place that they will have the opportunity to meet. We had a lot of good questions this last Wednesday night. We're not voting on a merger, so don't, don't go there. That's not what this is about. This is a vote in principle of allowing them to use our facility uh, for nine months, uh, it'll be on a, for Sunday afternoons. Uh, we we can say we want you to go, or they can say we're going to go someplace else. Uh, there needs to be a three month. We need to give them a three month notice, and so we'll meet again at six months uh, to kind of see where we're at at that time. Should we decide to do this, uh, they are going to. They've agreed to pay two thousand uh, dollars a month uh, to use the facilities, which would be the auditorium a few adult classrooms and the children's uh, area as well. They may use the fellowship hall every now and then, uh, but we're, we're, we're kind of waiting to see how that, that works out. They, uh, uh, theologically, they're very closely aligned to what Baptists are, and uh, so Baptists and, and Bible churches are part of Tarrant Baptist Association, for example. Uh, one of the things, when you're voting, uh, we're, we're, we have their proposal, but that proposal is going to be changed a little bit based on uh, their pastor, Keith Christensen, and myself going to meet with Gary Kroll of the Tarrant Baptist Association to see if we need to add anything for our protection or for theirs. Uh, you know, just things that we might not think of because they have a lot of experience in this. And so we want to make sure that, that we're covered either way. So we, we you know, with this, uh, we, I encourage you to vote. I encourage you to, to, if you cannot, you know, you're not going to be there on Sunday, you wouldn't be listening to this, but you can call the church office and leave a message through Wednesday night, all right? Wednesday at 7.30 when we finish prayer meeting, that's all the voting time. So you've got from Sunday to Wednesday to call in, give your name, and say, yes, I'm in favor, or no, I'm not in favor. It's just that simple. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and we'll give the results after after that. But we wanted to give people an opportunity who weren't able to come to the, the voting service on Sunday to be able to vote, for, you know, to have, have a say and be able to participate. And so that, that's how we're going to do it. Just call the church office, leave the message, and, and that'll, that'll, that'll help you get it, get it done. All right. Now, if you're wondering where I'm at, I'm in favor. That's why that's, I, I think it'd be great uh, for us to experiment and see, see where, where, how we can help another church uh, do this. So if you're wondering, well, where's the pastor? Well, that, that's my position. So, All right. Uh, any, I think that's about it for that. I hope that God will bless you and give you a good week. And I hope that everybody continues to stay safe. Until then, next week, God bless you.